This morning, we have a special guest speaker, um, and uh, out of Atascadero, this is Pastor Roger, who's going to be preaching today, so please give a big warm welcome for him. Okay. Well, it's good to be here. I thank Rick for inviting me, although it was Friday afternoon. <laughs> but anyway, I got our church. We've been in Atascadero now for, it's scary to say that, 30 years. But it's true, we have a vineyard church there, and uh, we actually have the privilege of being part of the vineyard, before it was a vineyard, when it was just a small group, in your Belinda, we were, uh, well, I was, my wife wasn't yet saved, but um, uh, I was part of the Quaker church that John Wimber and many others were at, and it was a group of, well, we started with about 20 people, Carl Tuttle, you guys know that name? He was a worship leader. Well, it wasn't really worship in those days. But anyway, uh, we sang songs and, and ministered to one another. But the thing of, of it is, these were what I would call, Karen, I'll put it in my back pocket. Okay, thanks. Uh, these were people who had been leaders in the Quaker church, your Belinda Friends Church. And I knew them because I was the youth minister at the time, uh, one of them. And um, the, the characteristic about this group was hunger. You know, they've been leaders in the church for a long time. They just wanted more of Jesus. And so we just got together to worship. That's all we knew to do. Because, I mean, there, none were filled with the Spirit at that time, um, just gathering to seek more of the Lord. And so that was the beginning of, of the vineyard. And this morning, I want to talk about uh, worshiping the Lord no matter what is going on in your life. I don't know if you have anything going on in your life, but... Normally we do, different seasons, but if you've been a follower of Jesus for any length of time, don't you find it relatively easy to worship the Lord when everything is going well? If you're in business, when you're business, if you're family, everything is financially sound, relationships are healthy, and everything is peaceful. But what about times of difficulty? What about those seasons of stress and anxiety uh, difficulty in, in relationships, difficulty with finances, all those things. Are we called to worship the Lord only during times of prosperity and success? Or are we called to worship and praise him in adversity as well? No matter what we're going on, even during times of failure. First Thessalonians 5, uh, so I got a little glare here. 516, are there lights back here that can shine on here? I didn't think so. Okay. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 uh, tells us to be joyful always, to pray continually, and to give thanks in all circumstances. Three words here, always, continually, and all. And they're there for a reason, because disciples of Jesus are called to worship the Lord on a continual basis no matter what our circumstances. That's called a lifestyle of worshiping God. We often go through the same types of sufferings as unbelievers, right? They don't have the spiritual aspect of it, but we often go through the same suffering, loss, pain, tragedy as, as unbelievers do. The, at the same time, we're called to have a higher standard of life because we're called to look at circumstances with the eyes of God, to see things how he sees them, and to realize that no matter what difficulties are coming against us, he gives us grace and mercy in the midst of them. Have you found that to be true? So believers usually talk about the desert experiences that they have in their lives as a place where God left them, a place where they no longer hear the voice of God, a place that's dry, filled with defeat, a season of frustration, loneliness. Believers don't like the desert. I mean, I don't like the desert in the natural, but we certainly don't like it in spiritual. They like, or we like the mountaintops, those times of refreshment and uh, in filling and all those wonderful seasons, blessing and prosperity. 
and we don't want to suffer and go through the hardships of desert of the desert but who does if we have a choice between the seasons of life on the mountaintops or the seasons of life in the in the storms prisons deserts and fires of life seasons on the mountaintops always win right always would take that so let me share with you some biblical examples of those who walked and lived in the literal desert. The first would be, before he was a powerful leader of the children of Israel, Moses, who was in the desert for 40 years. Then we find, immediately after calling down fire from heaven, Elijah was led into the desert. After being anointed as the future king of Israel, and then enjoying favor In the king's court, David had to literally flee for his life into the desert. When a major move of repentance came upon this entire city, the prophet Jonah fled and complained in a desert. Prior to one of the most powerful ministries in all of history, John the Baptist literally grew up and raised in the desert. When the heavens were torn open by God, Jesus was proclaimed to be uh, God's only son. Then he was immediately led into the desert. In fact, Jesus uh, regularly went into the desert to spend alone time with his father. And after experiencing this powerful conversion where he's knocked off a horse, Paul, who was converted, became Saul. I mean, Saul converted, <laughs> became Paul. Uh, he was led into the desert for several years to be groomed by God and taught. In the midst of a significant revival, Peter, I mean, uh, excuse me, uh, Philip found himself on a lonely desert road. And after enjoying many fruitful years as an apostle and overseer of several churches in Asia, John was banished on a desert island. Each of these people that we read about in Scripture, they had... Their experiences were different for each one of them, different reasons for everything happening. But one thing remains constant in all of these stories. God is able to develop our intimacy and our character in no better place than the desert. You might think, well, that's bad news. (laughs) Because nobody likes to be in the desert. But it's there that he's able to in ways that he can't do, really. and He can do anything, but normally doesn't do in different circumstances. He'll develop our character and intimacy with him in the desert. So believers that, I mean, that's why, that, this is why that we should not resist the desert. The desert is those valleys, those spiritual valleys in our lives where it feels like, a, like again, God has deserted us and, and things are overwhelming or stressful and all those kinds of things. We need to change our focus and not become disillusioned and frustrated and ang- anxious and, and angry. Okay? Believers, you see, who, are, who find them su- suddenly, you know, you're, you're, you're rolling along in life and suddenly you find yourself in the desert and you panic. It's like, why am I in this desert? They remember what the mountaintop was like. You know, the times of glory, and they can't wait to get back to what uh, are the so-called uh, heights of their relationship with the Lord. Also, they've been told, maybe you have as well, if you're in the desert, then you must be outside of God's will. Far too many preachers communicate that, that suffering and hardships are outside of the will of God. They teach that it's when we're prosperous, when we're successful, when God is blessing us, when his favor is upon us, all those kind of things. Um, uh, that's when we're in, in the will of God. If we're in the desert, then there's something uh, we, that must be wrong with us. And this is merely a continuation of the Hebrew thought for centuries, actually. Hebrews thought that. They believed it. And that could be nothing further than the truth. If this were true then the Apostle Paul, oh, look at you. And James, my gosh, what a voice you've got. I've, never, I've only heard you speak. And that's just average. But when you sing, my gosh. No, that's good. 
Yeah, that'll, that'll work. So for centuries, it was taught that if, if you're going through hardship, difficulty, suffering, uh, pain, loss, all those kinds of things, you're outside the will of God. That was what was taught. But if that is true, then the apostle Paul would have been outside the will of God almost all his life. Look at what he went through. Paul writes actually this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. I have learned to be content. We sang about this. We sang in the word, the word rest. It's very similar. Rest, peace, contentedness. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. So he first says, I've learned this, uh, whatever circumstances, then he wants to build on that and says, not just whatever, in any and every circumstance. And the word, as you see up there, the word need is, is actually the word humbled. I know what it is to be humbled. When you're in need, you kind of are humbled at times, isn't it true? You feel humbled, you feel desperate, you feel dependent. And so Paul knew what it was like to live in the humility of being hungry and not having his physical needs met. But he also had times of relative, uh, uh, that were relatively plentiful where his physical needs were be, being taken care of, but Paul's contentedness was not dependent on either one of those conditions. Paul's joy, his life, his ministry, nothing was dependent upon outward circumstances because he long ago learned the secret. Of, there's a secret of being content in any and every circumstance. Well, the reason that it's a secret is because in our natural minds, we rarely understand this kind of thinking. We think that it's only when things go well for us that we can be content, at peace, or at rest. But Paul said the secret he learned was how to be content even when things were at their lowest point, even at the dark moments of life. And then in the next verse, he writes this, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. You ever heard of that one? It's one of the most uh, quoted verses in Scripture, but it's typically quoted out of context. Now, it's okay to quote it out of context. It's a great passage to encourage people with. But in context, Paul is saying that he could do everything once he discovered the secret of being content in everything. In other words, our Father in heaven delights to reveal the secret of contentment to us. And then that supernatural contentment in every circumstance is going to lead us into victory over the circumstances. And then we can say, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. So verse 13, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength, is not the starting point of victory over circumstances. Claim it as much as you want. That's not the starting point. Spiritual contentment is. When kingdom contentment is revealed in your heart, because a secret, by the way, or a mystery, as Paul uses that term, that's a, that's a, reveal, that's a truth that has been revealed by God. A secret that was long hidden. That's a mystery. That's a secret. So God delights to reveal his secrets to his children. And, and, and so when kingdom uh, contentment is revealed to our hearts and we begin to walk and live as contented followers of Jesus who worship him no matter what the circumstances, then we can say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I wrote a note here, but I can't read it. I wrote a note during worship. Oh, what does it say? Oh, let's see. Let's see. Oh, that's good. <clears throat> so, <laughs> Paul, <laughs> I was thinking about, you know how politicians quote Ronald Reagan uh, sometimes say that, that say, peace through strength? Okay? I mean, that's not bad political. That's a, that's, a good, that's a good deal. But the kingdom is a little different. The kingdom is strength through peace. So, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That strength 
When? When we are filled with his peace, with his contentment, and we're able to enter into the Sabbath rest as it teaches in the book of Roman, or, uh, Hebrews. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul writes this. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships. The word hardship is translated persecution, tribulation, affliction, different ways that, in different contexts. Uh, but we, we want you to know about the hardships um, we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Hey, wait a minute, I thought this was the Apostle Paul. Yeah. We despaired even of life. Indeed, our hearts felt the sentence of death. Well, do you think the Apostle Paul, in the midst of such, whatever was going on at that time, do you do you believe that he, he felt outside God's will? I don't think so. Even though he was suffering to the point of despair, feeling the sentence of death upon him, Paul was a worshiper. Paul knew that nothing could prevent him from being content, and that enabled him to be able to do all things through the power of Jesus within him. Strength through peace. That's Paul's emphasis. Then he says this, but this happened that we might not rely upon ourselves, but God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly per uh, peril and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. So right in the middle of Paul's personal de desert, he knew that God was um, allowing this to happen in order to strip him of self-sufficiency. That's actually happened, and I don't have the time to tell you stories, but I have several stories, Tricia. We, we have several stories of God stripping us. And some, a couple of times he's told me in advance that he was gonna do it. I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like to be humbled. I don't like to be stripped of self-sufficiency. You know, we've got the independent, I can do it kind of mentality in this country. But, you know, it, it, when God does it you, know it, you know that it's a good thing, even though it's painful. Well, Paul was being stripped of this, and that's one of the primary purposes for the desert, the desert is one of the best places to, for God to build character. Because after all, Paul wrote in Ephesians 5 that, that suffering produces perseverance. I mean, <laughs> you, you can't persevere unless, uh, unless you're going through something difficult, okay? That's the meaning of the term perseverance. So suffering produces it, but then perseverance produces character. So let me go back to the biblical... Um, uh, illustrations I mentioned before. But before I do that, I, I skipped over a part because I wanted, to, I wanted to look at this concept of, if you see it in this passage, there's a progression that's going on that um, Paul writes that he proclaims that God delivered them, that he will deliver them, and God will continue to deliver them. So in your life, God, if you've followed Jesus for any length of time, God has delivered you at times, Right? He saved you. He's brought you out of things. Well, he's going to do it again. He just is always faithful no matter what we go through. So it's not a matter of um, I can do all things. It's not emphasis. is not on the I. The emphasis is on through him who's in me. He can do all things, really, because I don't live, Paul said. It's Jesus living in me that does all these things. Anyway, back to the desert. When Moses was in the desert, the significance of being there is he received the call of God on his life. He heard the voice of God in the desert and he began a relationship in the desert of unique intimacy. When Elijah ran away into the desert, the prophet learned something very significant. One thing I just talked about, he learned how to be dependent upon the Lord which should be relevant to us as followers of Jesus, where we allow him to strip, ourselves, strip us of, independence, of dependency on ourselves. David was in the desert for a long time. David learned patience and forgiveness in the desert. He wrote many of his songs there, songs that expressed his lack his, or his ignorance in why he was in the desert, because face it, we don't know oftentimes why we're here in that spiritual dryness. Well, he didn't either. 
But his songs always concluded with praise despite his lack of understanding. Again, something that we can learn from. The prophet Jonah ran into the desert and grew in his understanding of God's nature, God's compassion. John the Baptist, as I said, was raised in the desert. He built an entire relationship with the Lord there. Jesus defeated the devil in the desert and he would return there often to be with his father. The desert was not a lonely, frustrating place for Jesus. It was a, actually became a place of strength for him. The apostle Paul, who was a newborn believer when he was brought into the desert, uh, Paul grew in his character there and he formed him. Paul talks about it in Galatians chapter one during that time. When I mentioned uh, earlier Philip, I said he was led into the desert, actually transported miraculously into the desert while he was in the midst of a great revival. How would that make you feel? I mean, hey, God is, read that passage. God is, is, is pouring out his salvation, his healing power, miracles, demons are coming out. It's crazy good. And Philip is in the middle of this Suddenly, he, he finds himself on a lonely desert road. I'm like, oh, thanks, God. That was, uh, hey, I was having a great time here. I mean, you know, talk about wondering if you're outside the will of God. How did I get here? But Philip didn't think. He cooperated with what God was doing, and he did not complain about his relocation. Why me, God? That kind of a thing. He just saw what God was doing, and he put his hands to it. And Philip had the opportunity of bringing salvation to an Ethiopian that many believe was the, uh, that led to the evangelization of the, of the entire country, Ethiopia. Because of his obedience to go into the desert, far away from revival, uh, God gave Philip even greater blessings. And then finally, the apostle John. Uh, all of the incredible rev visions that he had in the book of Revelation was being on a deserted desert island. He was banished on this island on, as a prisoner and left to die there. And, but he didn't think of it, I don't believe, as judgment from God or being outside the blessings or the will of God. I believe he knew that he was right in the middle of God's will and there's no one in history who's had the type of visions and revelations that John did. All in the middle of the desert, by the way. So is the desert a wonderful place to be? No, yes. No, <laughs> in the sense that it's lonely, it's hot, it's miserable, it feels like God's left you, it's not an enjoyable experience, but yes, in the way that in the desert is where God is, often, and where he desires to work in our lives in the most important areas, because this is the reason for which God created us. Dependency, intimacy, and character, integrity, that kind of intimate relationship with him. And that's, he forms that in the desert. The desert experience, our experiences in the desert are similar to the storms of life, the fires of life, and the prisons of life. Nobody likes to be in a storm, a fire, or a prison, or a desert. But those are the type of experience that help shape us as followers of Jesus. They help us become worshipers of God that we are created to be. Remember the three Hebrews that were, uh, who the king threatened to kill by burning in fire? You read the text. They did not wonder if they were outside God's will. They did not complain that things were not fair. They, they did not run from the difficulty. They stood right in the very midst of this ex potential death experience and proclaimed their allegiance to God no matter what happened to them. They knew, just like Paul, the sentence of death was upon them. And what happened? They were thrown into it in order to die. And a fourth one stood with them. And because of the presence of the fourth one, I believe Jesus himself, the three of them came out untouched by fire. I mean, they're very close. Did, have you ever been around a campfire? Yeah. They're closed. They're, nothing smelled like smoke. 
That's the result of learning how to be a worshiper in the midst of the firestorms, prisons, and deserts of life because it won't have that negative effect on you when you're able to persevere, as James says, even with joy. And I really like the story of, um, of, of when Peter was in prison, recorded in Acts chapter 12. Followers of Jesus, they were called the way at the time. They were being persecuted all around and uh, Jerusalem. And Peter's closest friend, James, had just been killed. Peter was then arrested and chained between two Roman guards. And a probable trial awaited. He was probably going to be executed the very next day. But look with me at verse 6 of chapter uh, 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 of this chapter 12 is absolutely incredible under the circumstance. It says, the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Are you aware that God does not normally choose to answer his children when they are filled with complaints and criticism and judgment? When, they're trying to all, when all they're trying to do is get out of the difficult situation or get away from that difficult person, God answers his, 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 his people when they look at the difficulties around him and yet, Lord, I'm going to choose to be a worshiper in, in, despite him, right in the midst of him. I may not understand it, but I'm going to choose to worship you right in the middle of the desert firestorm and prison of life, just like Paul and Silas did when they were in prison. So here is Peter, and Peter was a man of action, right? He didn't wait around for anything. So he's thrown in this dark, dismal, first century prison in order to wait execution. And not only that, he was chained on both sides by a Roman guard. And yet, it says Peter was sleeping. How can anybody sleep under such circumstances, let alone somebody as impulsive as Peter? The storms of life are raging all around Peter, and this disciple is able to rest in prison, at peace in the midst of this personal storm. Does this sound at all familiar? Years earlier, Peter had been in a boat with Jesus. And a violent storm came up, and a few of them were veteran fishermen, and it was so strong of a storm that they feared for their lives. They cried out to Jesus to save their lives, and Jesus rebuked the wind, and the, the wind calmed down, and Jesus questioned their lack of faith. What was Jesus doing at the time? Sleeping. Imagine somebody being able to sleep in the midst of a raging, violent, life-threatening storm. Nobody can do that, unless you're the son of God. Well, Peter learned his lesson because he knew that Jesus was with him. And that as bad as things appear, even if I'm going to be executed tomorrow morning, I can find rest in the presence of Jesus, because when Jesus is in your boat, it does not matter how large the waves are. When Jesus is there with you in prison, it doesn't matter if death awaits you. When Jesus is in the fires with you, you can do all things through him who gives you strength. When Jesus is in the desert with him, you can worship him and give him praise. Our problem is that we keep forgetting that Jesus is in the boat with us. That Jesus is in the prison with us. That he is standing in the fire with us. We often get distracted by these things called prison storms, fires, and deserts of life. The difficult circumstances of life. We get distracted or, or difficult people. Difficult people can sometimes be even worse because you just want to get a... You ever been around a difficult person that you want to just get away from? A lot of times God has arrange things for them to be sandpaper in your life. Well, I don't, like, I don't like to sand. I've helped people, you know, paint and do those kind of that prep work. I don't like sanding. But God, and it doesn't feel good when people sand you, sandpaper your life. But that's what God does with difficult people. You don't have to take them home with you. But nevertheless, a lot of times they form, help form the character that God wants to build in you. So, um, 
what we do, however, we wonder when these difficult circumstances, difficult people around us, why God doesn't seem to care. Why is he allowing these things to happen for us? But all the while, this is the truth, he is in your boat. He does not leave the boat. He does not go anywhere. He is in the desert with you. We are the ones that get distracted, fearful, stressed out, angry, all that kind of stuff. We are the ones who blame shift, wonder why. We, don't, uh, we lack that faith as the disciples did. So here's the word of God for us. Worship the Lord. No matter what you're going through today, or have been going through. Sometimes it's seasonal. Or maybe it's gonna start tomorrow. We don't know. We don't know when these difficult circumstances happen. But whatever it is, worship him. David's famous Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that's the valley, that's the desert, and it's, 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 it's the shadow of death. Even though I walk there, I will fear no evil. How could David write such words? For you are with me. That's it. God is always faithful. He's always there with you, no matter how you feel. You see, we don't know the future. We don't fully understand why things happen to us, but we can come to the place of resting in his presence, knowing that he's there right with us, no matter how oppressive the prison, no matter how high the waves are, no matter how hot the fire. And so this assurance of his presence leads us into this lifestyle of worship and praise where Paul can uh, conclude and he can say, as we started this teaching, be joyful always. Pray continually. Here's, a, here's someone who learned the secret of contentness, right? Telling us that we can be joyful always, we can pray continually, and we can give thanks in, in all circumstances for guess what? That is God's will for you. You wanna know what God's will for you is in, is in your life? It's right there. You do that, and you're in God's will. Let's stand. I guess you guys do that, that's what I do, so. It's admittedly difficult to discern the source of our difficulties, okay? Sometimes it's important, often it's not. But regardless of the source, the Lord is looking for how you will respond to that which is happening to you. It's not so much what happens to you, but how you respond to that which happens to you. Let me say that again. In God's way of looking at things, it's not so much, I mean, he sees what you're going through, but it's not so much what happens to you. It's how are you going to respond in the midst of what happens to you? That's what he's looking for. He knows how lonely and frustrating the desert is. He understands our fears in the midst of the fires and the prisons, but he all, he's above it all. God sees what we do not see, and he wants you to see what he sees. I mean, that's faith after all. And he wants you to worship him in the desert in all circumstances of life. And one last passage today. 1 Peter 4.12. Peter writes this about it. Now Peter's the one that went through this too, right? I'm sure he learned the secret of contentment. And he said, dear friends, do not be surprised. In other words, do not say, why me? Why is this happening to me? Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. So if you find yourself in the middle of difficult, trying circumstances. Maybe it's even, maybe it's a demonic attack. Or maybe you feel some way that God is testing you in a specific area, something you need to go through. We would like to pray for you this morning. I don't know if Dominic's up here, but anyway, he will be. We wanna pray for you this morning. Stand alongside you to, to help um, 
give you hope. Because the desert storms, fires, and prisons of life, as I've said a couple of times, is where one of those places where God can form your character like no other place. And then as he develops your character, you'll learn how to persevere through those things uh, in faith, and that will give you victory over them. Amen. Thank you for having me. And I thank um, James, what am I doing now? <laughs> okay, go want. to where you're praying, right? Are they praying on the sides where the windows are? Okay, all right. James.